hardware adaptation. Such a terrible uh, title. So, <clears throat> this is a presentation about how we port the Selfish OS to the OSC. And um, just to kind of help set the frame, that, um, that um, I'd like to say up by by start up by saying that things are not e always easy. When you want a device made, you go to an ODM, which is kind of like a factory, kind of hardware maker, etc., uh, where you find a certain reference device after looking through specific, uh, different specifications, etc., etc. But these devices that you'll find are not typically very productized. Um, because they're reference designs, it's quite often that you'll find devices out in the field, they're different products, different brands, but in practice they're very uh, close to each other in family. So, the main point that I'm trying to make here is that the devices that you'll find, uh, devices you'll find from these factories, will come with Android drivers. There's no such thing as Selfish OS drivers. So, when we say that we're porting Selfish OS, we are in fact, well, porting, not creating Selfish OS drivers, etc. Sorry, I'm just going to move here. Uh, and often, when you go to the M, ODM, you'll only get part, a part of the source codes uh, for the device. And after a bit of a struggle with the hardware, uh, putting a different industrial designs, or even get fixing the basic Android drivers in it, you get a product like you have in your hands today. And this is basically about a story about how you see the sausage getting made. So. Turning to the topic of your OSC, so this, basically every other Selfish OS device that has been productized has been in my hands the first time and put, I was the one doing the porting work for it. But this one uh, has been done by Simonas, uh, Sledges on IC, that many of you might actually know, uh, who's uh, kind of heading up the porting community at this point. And uh, the OSC, as you know, is uh, Qualcomm MSM 8909 CPU. 5-inch, uh, 720p uh, resolution, 1.3 gigahertz of uh, uh, a quad-core processor and 2 gigabytes of RAM, which is very nice. Um, but as I said before, when you go to an M ODM, you're not really going to get the so full source code tree. But we had the basics, a kernel source code, the closest enough uh, code, hour, code hour, which is kind of Qualcomm's open source offering and a working Android image to play Flash. And in, in, in addition to that, we had uh, Open Channel and good relations with the ODM, which made all this quite possible. But now, okay, so this is kind of how, how things usually go for me. What do you do when you get a device in your hands that are meant to be coming a selfish OS device? You do a, a few things. First off, you want to check if the device actually works, because chances are it has been damaged in transit. You then want to test that, okay, so the device vendor has uh, has given you an uh, Android image to flash to the device. You then test, does this Android image, image actually work? If it doesn't boot up, it's usually a quite bad sign. And then you have to go back and tell the internet you get the damn thing that you actually want to try to use the device for. Uh, you want to check if the, the uh, hardware support on the device actually works, like check the sensors, does the touch work, GPS. Does it, is it able to you may even make uh, uh, phone calls, or does it support the right bands for Europe, for example? <coughs> You'll often get um, source code, and um, the question is, does the source code actually build for the kernel? Which is quite often it doesn't. Uh, does it still boot up the device after you made a boot image? And Okay, you check a few, a few more things, then you check, okay, did the device actually catch fire at any point during this, this process? If things seem somewhat stable and sane, then you can move on to Selfish OS porting. Now, as many of you might actually know, we have um, the way to do Selfish OS ports, like many people have run down to Selfish OS, to Core Fairphone, to too many of the other devices. We use the Selfish OS hardware adaptation kit. And we use this ourselves, because if it's not uh, good enough for ourselves, why would it be good enough for our dear community of porters? And what it consists of is kind of license terms, like pre for non-commercial users, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but it also comes with documentation, patches to make the Android uh, C library and so on compatible with Selfish OS. And it comes with a community, which is the Selfish OS portals uh, community channel, which is really quiet today, because everybody is here. And it's basically a community with years of tacit knowledge about how to do things. And of course it comes with 
instructions about how to build self self visualized images. So, this is a photo um, of the kind of process you go through. This is from Mobile World Congress. We're going to have a meeting with uh, one of the device vendors, and they had given us the device, and the meeting was going to be 48 hours after. And of course, I got the job of uh, sitting and making self visuals work on it because it makes it much more interesting uh, demo to them. So the kind of pro process you go through is, first off, you have to patch the source tree that you have with it. You have to get hyper boot, which is kind of like a different bootloader mechanism for the device going. Um, uh, then you have to build the Selfish OS hardware glue, which is kind of what gets combined with Selfish OS, and then you have something that actually boots on the device, which then uh, ties together with the hardware uh, uh, adaptation layer in Android. Then you have to install it on your device, and uh, then you do lots of debugging and tracing because things rarely work the first time. And then eventually, when things mostly work, then when it's ready to hand to other people, like the experts, like uh, telephony, uh, audio, um, those people working past there, etc. And uh, they start uh, figuring out, okay, what's the problem in the area? Because their expertise is not getting the device to boot up in the first place. The expertise is fixing the particular problems in their area. And um, with the YLC, we had additional challenges uh, because it's a dual SIM device. We both had to do, do it from the hardware adaptation point of view, getting the entire uh, stack uh, going. We, uh, the middleware, then we have to fix the UI, etc. And then eventually we got a working uh, dual SIM implementation. But also it was Android 5.0, so that was a couple of additional challenges there. And quirks here and there, like for example on the other one, the LED was RGB, and on this device it's just an LED, um, etc. etc. And how the display handling is handled, and so on. But um, Naturally, getting the UI running is, isn't all the trouble because you want to be able to run Android applications. That requires a little bit of handiwork to get that working on a new device. Um, you want to fix that, uh, for example, the graphics is still looking good in the wire because the displays vary in quality and in colors and so on. Uh, the DPI might be different, etc. Um, you want to make a recovery mode because, as we learned the hard way, that file systems will eventually go to total crap and you need to be able to reinstall your system some way or the other. Um, you want to make gift boxes for the device because that's, well, the phone on its own is not very nice. You need to have manual, chargers, um, this, uh, general design around it. You want to get uh, GPS positioning working faster than taking 20 minutes of standing still. Uh, for example, a GPS. Um, <laughs> You want to be able to do factory reset, which is actually a little harder than it seems. Um, you want to do flashing tools, because uh, when things come to care, or you have to do it in the shop, you don't want to tell them a huge list of uh, instructions, you just want, just want them to run one command, and they flash the device, and that's it. Um, you want to make QA tools, you want to link up the, it with the uh, remaining quality assurance, insurance, <coughs> quality assurance infrastructure that you have in the company. Uh, for example, we have robots, so the devices would be put into one of those robots, they would, the robots would poke in certain places of uh, the screen and running automated test cases, checking if the output is correct and so on. Uh, factory test cases, because uh, despite what it seems like sometimes with hardware, after they produce the hardware, they actually go to test the devices and actually ch check if they work. Uh, so they test the touchscreen, GPS working, etc. Certification related test cases like uh, taking a big wand uh, with static electricity, poke it against the device a couple of times. If the device continues running afterwards, you can get your certification. Um, and of course, eventually there, there's kind of care device, uh, care functionality like uh, customer service display. And you can bring it up and test if the device is actually working in certain areas instead of trying to debug manually if the touchscreen is working, the sensors are working, what's exactly broken. Not since that will be related to hardware adaptation, but uh, usually we run uh, primary device exercises where we coerce most of the company into uh, using the device as the daily uh, device that they're using. Uh, because there's only so much test cases and quality assurance that goes over the exact same steps over and over again can catch. But let's say that your pregnant wife can't uh, call you anymore, then suddenly you know you have a bit of a customer problem. Um, and in this we also established that the, it's uh, quite important to maintain a good method of receiving feedback 
some people are okay with contributing to Bugzilla, but you have to con uh, collect um, information about the crashes, the weird quirks that you see out in the field because you're not always nearby your Bugzilla instance. Um, and of course, there'll be different tempers of uh, following, for example, internally. We have development where all the developers put their stuff in mostly untested. Testing where QA has, has at least tested a little bit and then release where there's been a more test extensive testing round. Um, I have been running personally on Devil on my devices for basically since the beginning of YOLA. And it has gone up and down here and there. Uh, because in the end, if it's not good enough for the employees of your company, why would it be good enough for your customers? And despite all our good efforts, sometimes things go to shit. And uh, you have to reflash the devices. So. Um, you think that the quality or the good at uh, the first time the first exp uh, impression that people get is not good enough so you spend a couple of days in a cold warehouse and reflash your devices or pay people to do it which we learned the second time around to do and um, well eventually you get a product you pack the gift box back up again hope nothing was missing from the gift box and you put it you try to get it shipped but sometimes things go wrong um, you can note that suddenly, suddenly there are certification issues, customs issues, like they don't believe that the value of the device is the right, or the VAT has been paid, etc. Uh, device is breaking in transit, uh, payments not making in time, or something like that happening uh, wrong, or change the address of the customer, and planes crashing. It hasn't happened to us yet, but I'm sure it will. And uh, so on. And eventually, you can put it in the hands of your customers, like with this last time around, and we have done here today. And that's how Yolo C was made. And there's probably a lot more details about just how, how, how the sausage was made, but this is the overview of it.